Can have that. Just say it. Just Rawlinson and Gideon. Uh, it been uh, Ahmed. Well, yeah. They've been following the work at New Mexico for a while. Where they, where are they able to? In Australia, yeah. In uh, AGI, I don't know what that is. AGI.io? Mm -hmm. AGI? Mm -hmm. I, the, the, I, you know, business. It's, um, it's not exactly sure what they are. They're like a small incubator slash research group. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how they're funded. Our, our general intelligence yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they've followed the work here for a long time, um, and it, they've written, there are probably some posts, it's one specific blog post that if you saw it, you vaguely remember reading it. Mm -hmm. This one about like how to build an artificial general intelligence, and they really, but they, that might sound a little crazy to you, but um, mm -hmm. But That's what we're doing. Right, sure. But, um, so they, they really try to lay out like what are the problems of intelligence uh -huh. that need to be solved and really lay it out. And and they like they they refer to the new methods. Oh, that's right. Who knows? Like 2016 or 2017 as well, yeah. right? So they've been following the work here for a while. Yeah. If, if you remember Felix, uh, he's he's a big fan of them. He, uh -huh. he, he thinks they have really good work. Okay. And they had a recent paper on uh, predictive capsule networks as well. So they're obviously on the same wavelength as we're doing here. Um, yes, yeah, so we can get started. Um, so this is a paper uh, just came out this year. So they're looking at uh, recurrent, they call it recurrent sequence memory, or RSM. Is it published or is it on uh, an uh, archive? I think it's end, not end of May, so just really just about. Yeah, yeah, it just came so out. So it's not, uh, it's a, just a preprint. Just a preprint, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they were in touch with us to, uh, to get feedback and see, um, to explore potential collaborations as well. So that's something that we, we decided we'd take a look at the paper and see how it might integrate with what we're doing here. And, and think about that for the future. So what they were trying to do with uh, recurrent sequence memory was design a, um, a biofeasible uh, learning algorithm that allows higher order sequence learning. So overcome some of the limitations of um, uh, existing sequence learning and do so at much lower memory requirements. Uh, so that constraints the rules that they set out for themselves uh, I put here. So local credit assignment. So they define that by uh, limiting backpropagation across at most two layers. And I think they justify this by talking about potential layer of active dendrites that are sort of like neurons in and of themselves. So they allow backprop across two layers, but not more than that. Um, and they don't allow any uh, time travel or synaptic memory beyond the previous time step, which is common for some of these like LSTM and RNNs where they just have direct access to previous historical states. Obviously the brain only has access to what's happening right now and everything else has to be stored in some sort of memory. So the model is, um, highly inspired by HTM and the work here, as we'll see. And uh, it's set up, in general, sort of like a predictive autoencoder. So um, a general autoencoder is something that takes an input, this is like an MNIST digit, to um, perform some re-representation, goes through a bottleneck, and then produces uh, an output that's a decoded prediction of the same input. So it tries to predict itself. We have a loss as we compare the difference between the two. So we uh, optimize the model to reduce the loss so that we're generating high fidelity versions of the input through a, a smaller Latin space. A predictive autoencoder does the same thing, but instead of passing in, um, instead of trying to predict the same exact input, you try to predict the next input at t plus one. And so it's just doing a next uh, sequence prediction. Can I ask a, a, a high level question yeah. here? So if they're familiar with the HTM sequence memory, and I assume they're comparing other things like LSTM or something like that. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what problems do they see in like uh, the HTM sequence memory that they're trying to address? Because we have a biophysical, feasible, or bio-constrained high-order sequence memory learning system. Mm -hmm. uh, are they trying to get lower memory requirements than, than our network? Are they trying to get different types of behaviors? Are they just trying to come up with another one? What's the I think, ultimate goal? I think they were actually trying to take the work from HTM and bring it into the deep learning world and get some and, and demonstrate it on new problem types. So they actually referenced the work on the Raver grammars that was maybe 2016. Um, they don't actually reproduce that themselves, but they, they have a couple of other demonstration tasks that they want to kind of show this working on. Um, oh, okay, so in that way, it's a little bit different than the goal you said here, which is, uh, I mean, that goal is the goal of the uh, of HM sequence memory. I would say it's feasible, I would say bio-constrained. But other than that, um, you could say that's our goal too. So. So maybe they're doing the same kind of thing that we're trying to do right now, just take that biologically defined yes. uh, network and bring it into the machine learning world. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, very is, aligned with what we're Okay, so which is not, that goal in my mind does not state that. Um, no, that, what, that goal is what you would tell a deep learning audience. Okay. 
uh, okay. because they don't, in the deep learning world, they don't really have that. I got so, it. So, I got it. Uh, it's, okay. it's not the goal you would tell us because yes. we already yeah. do that. That's yeah. what we do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. But you're right. I mean, it's extremely parallel to the, the mission that we're on right, right now. I, 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 I didn't catch that. that. Right. 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 Um, and they reference like four of Numenta's papers. No, I'm not worried about that. I'm just trying to understand what's the difference between what they're doing and what we're doing and why are yep. they not unsatisfied with what was wrong with our model and the answer is that probably maybe they think there's nothing wrong with it. They just want to bring that into the machine learning world and apply it to machine so learning. So they illuminate a couple of the issues that they see with this kind of architecture which is inspired by HDM yeah. models and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, so, so generally set up as a predictive autoencoder. Um, so we're trying to do next item prediction. Um, and then so in terms of the architecture, what they have is uh, columns and cells. That's going to be very familiar. Um, they call these groups, but these are just uh, mini columns. Um, and so that we have a, a proximal uh, weight matrix or kind of proximal dendrites coming down and taking the input. And those are shared for all cells in the column, just like an HDM. And then we also have, a, in this case, a single active dendrite on each cell that is um, taking input from the previous memory state. So this is a... Uh, uh, the, the memory, the kind of activity in the network at t minus one. So they restrict it. We have multiple dendrites per neuron. Right. They're going down to one. That's right. Is there a logic behind that, or is it just that's what they did? They don't discuss that. Um, memory issue. Or it could be a hardware implementation yeah. issue or something like that. You know, this is just software, right? Now. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I, I, they, don't, they don't discuss that. I think that okay. because memory is one of their um, goals, they, they tout the ability to do all of this with essentially two matrices of this size. Uh -huh. One is for the current memory state, and one is for this inhibition matrix, and that's, that's everything. Okay. So like HGM has a separate uh, kind of predictive state of cells. Yeah. They do everything in a single matrix of activity. So it's a little bit different in that respect. Okay. And, that, and that has some implications that I think are important to discuss. So, so there's no predictive state to the neurons? Or yeah, all, all the predictive state is inherent to the representation that is the same as the kind of before representation. So, okay, so that's a key difference. I don't see how that works yet. So, uh, I'll wait to see um, so this, is, this is the steps that the network goes through uh, during training. Um, so we're actually going to sum the fully connected. So we have fully full connections here. These aren't sparse. So that's another point of difference. Um, so we're going to sum the inputs. They're connected from to each other, like this population cells is connected to this population of cells. So that's true for the recurrence. So this is the previous um, activity. Uh -huh. So this is uh -huh. recurrent, and this is feed forward. So this is like a, a new training okay. example. Okay. So, so when you say fully connected, uh, there's this is not a sparse matrix. Which, which of those are you talking about? Uh, uh, the proximal dendrite is okay. not sparse. Right. It's, it's fully connected. Okay. So it ha it has potential connections to every uh, pixel in the right. training. Oh, and you say fully connected from both the and the last memory state too. Yeah, so exactly. So these are, yeah, everything is really connected okay. here. They do sparsify, but they do sparsification uh -huh. by masking. And so that's after the point of, uh, that's after the parameters. So we do a sum of these two, um, and then we, we have this inhibition matrix. You can think of that as a matrix just like this one. So for every cell, we have an inhibition state. They, this is inspired by a refractory period of a cell. The cells mm -hmm. don't fire for a certain period of time after firing most recently. So we keep track of when each cell fired most recently, and we decay that matrix over time. So this is going to inhibit activity for cells that most recently fired. So it's similar to what we do for boosting. It's yeah, sort of the, it's sort of the short, converse. It's very boosting. short term boosting though. It's only for, yeah. only for the refractive period. Uh, but it's exponential decay, so it can actually be quite long term that the memory stays around. So we never actually get all put into zero again. Right. The inhibition for... Uh, well that doesn't seem... Uh, okay, that's fine. It's, it, that's not sort of biologically... So I don't know, that's not biologically accurate, so... But it's okay. Um, Okay, so yes, yeah, so we inhibit the result of this sum, and then we do uh, that we do k winners, and so this is producing masks that are column wise and cell wise. And so this is going to produce, uh, it's going to pick a single cell um, for each of these columns, and then based on the activity of the, it's going to be like a, a max pooling. So we're going to pick, let's say k equals two, we're going to pick two cells, two columns, and so we're going to have this cell and this cell that come out. Okay, so it's going to pick. A sparse set of mini columns, just like we do with a yes. special pooler. Yep. Okay, and then and within fixed. each mini column, it's going to pick one, one cell. cell. Okay. So they're the same basic representation scheme. It sounds like where you want to represent an input uh, in, uh, some in, in some context, yeah. uniquely in some context. It's very similar representation scheme. I think there's one major difference, which maybe I'll get to in a second, because I think this is the thing that is most interesting to talk about probably. Um, but does everything make sense up to here, just in, at a high level, what so, the so model is doing? Yeah. Um, and then 
we generate outputs, so we're going to, it, the primary output is going to be the, uh, the memory state, so this kind of activity is going to become the new memory for the next time step. So this is going to be decayed as well. So, uh, there's an optional decay term. They prove, they show that this doesn't requ isn't required, so you can just remember the previous memory state. You you decaying is decaying the activation states mm -hmm. of those? Yeah. So these are, these are uh, floating point activation yes. states? Yes, it's just, all continuous. And you're de 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 decreasing them some exponential on yes. the state? Um, so for the MNIST uh, demonstration, they actually don't decay at all. They just treat the memory as the previous time step. Um, so the, everything gets zeroed on every time step, and then the new uh, memory, that's the input, the re recurrent input, is just the activation from the previous well, time what step. What is the sequence in MNIST? MNIST doesn't have a sequence. Yeah, sorry. I should have probably talked about the demonstrations that are going to do earlier. But essentially, it's, um, they design sequences. So like 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 3, 2, 1 is an example of a high order sequence. Uh -huh. So they're going to pass in these digits. So every time they see a label, so these are the labels, 0, 1, 2, 3. So they're eight. making sequences out of MNIST characters. Exactly. So they're going to randomly sample from MNIST all the zero digits, and that's going to be the next training sample. So you're constantly seeing um, different digits as we're passing things in. We never direct, the network never directly observes the labels. It has to um, yeah. infer the label and then predict the correct next sequence term. Well, that, if, it's, it, if you don't label it, it doesn't infer the label. It just knows that zeros are zeros or something like that. Right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. in this, there's, uh, the zeros vary quite a bit. Yeah, I understand. So they have to have come up with a representation that all the zeros are similar and all the ones are Well, are they, are they labeling them or not? Like, because you don't, in, this, in a problem like this, you don't have to label them. You, yeah. You could just say it's going to figure it out on its own somehow. I don't know. Well, we do need yeah, but zero will have to predict a one regardless of what version of zero it was. Yeah. I so that's the constraint. So it's, 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 not a exact, it's not a label, but it's uh, you have to have a similar representation of zeros. Well, it's assuming that there's something in the structure of the zeros that are similar. Yeah. So it's a SIF in some sense. It's, it, but there are no, no, never do you feed in a label to the system. You just feed that's in right. a That's right. Yeah. So all we know is that the information content of the representation is sufficient to predict the next digit, as yeah. well as to predict the current digit. Yeah. Um, so the label is in there somewhere. Yeah. And I'm sorry, it's a sequence that holds uh, 12 digits there? And then you pass this in over and over again. That's 12 digits. Sorry? The, the old 12 yeah. digits. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. in that order. Yeah. So, so these are um, these are like single order sequences, like you can learn mm -hmm. this trivially, and then this one requires uh, some additional order because you have to remember. Uh, the, the zero came first. Well, and, and of course you have to also to remember, remember that eight before that. The, the, the first and the second third have to be represented differently too, right? It's so. Um, well, in order to predict the zero three one correctly, you have to remember the previous eight digits. Yeah, yeah. Or represent them uniquely. Yeah. yeah. And sorry if you said this. Uh, so the, each of these zeros is it the same image or is it like no, 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 no. No. so every time they show a zero it's just randomly sampled? Yes. Okay. This is really key, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite different from how we do the Yeah, this uh, we yeah. only use labels, right? We don't But no, the, if we don't the use temporal use memory, uh, we would our temporal memory would not be able to do this task. Uh, well, and to the extent that the spatial pooler on its own would categorize the zero block oh. similar to the one, you know, to the zero inputs and the one similar to the one. So the spatial pooler could do that to some extent on its own, then we, it is similar to To some extent, but it wouldn't yeah. be able to get their accuracies. Yeah. Right here it's nice that the, 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 the sequence, knowing the sequence helps you sort of label the numbers, which yeah. is nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. So I think that, that that's one of the points that I want to make, so that the, um, the representation that includes the prediction is better at um, doing labeling and doing classification as well. They report uh, like 97, 99% um, accuracy. classification accuracy. And measured by how? By attaching a classification predictor onto the uh, representation and then doing So that's the 97 from 99% and this classification. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, but no, the classification of the next digit. Uh, it's the, it's the, sorry, the next digit yeah. from the hidden, the memory state. Yeah. So we also generate an image. Okay, so okay. We're so using it's, not, it's not an MNIST classification. Though. Right. It's, it's a sequence. And they do that, to, is that yeah, 99 sorry, yes. to 97% uh, uh, measured along the way, all, or is it only at the end? Or, you know, is it, is it that the ability to predict that last digit one, or is it every single digit? Uh, it's like a traditional machine learning validation, so you, you hold out a separate test set, and then you run at inference time, or after you've trained, you run it. Right, but, you, but while you're presenting the sequence, you, you count the error at every single point in the sequence. Yeah, so but during the printing, you can also get accuracy numbers. Yes, but yeah. that, then you can't, I mean, the 97 to 99% suggests that they don't do it at every point in the sequence, because 
after the first zero, and you really can't. I assume it's after. Uh, it's after. It's after training. These numbers. No, are no, no, no. Uh, um, digits. Imagine that. I'm assuming there's multiple high order sequences, or, or are there not? Um, th so this is like you pass them this high order. They call this a high order sequence. They pass yeah. them just this for the entire model. Okay. They also try. So they don't. They sequences. don't do multiple sequences. Oh, they don't. Do, I missed that. They don't do other digits. It's only these four digits. Or, or also they have other examples of higher order sequences. Imagine like. They only do that one sequence at a time. Yeah, but when they're giving this accuracy number, it's only these four digits that are being presented in this sequence. It's only this that's one sequence. Right. It's not, uh, it's actually, it's not yeah, a 10, those, those it's not a ten yeah. category like problem anymore. Right. Four, yeah. I'm it's asking if it's only this one sequence, because if I, let's say I trained it on 20 different 12-digit um, uh, sequences, then there would be multiple sequences that begin zero, and therefore my prediction that the first digit would be would be really bad. Right. If, if if only I trained on this one sequence, that's it. Then then the first zero I can predict one very accurately. Yep. Um, so that's that to me why I asked where did the 97 97 percent come from because um, if you were training on multiple sequences, which I assumed that was the case, then you would have to either determine to make that measurement at the end or some far way into it or. Um, but you're saying no. They're just this is the one. They're training on this one 12-digit sequence. That's it. Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah. And then therefore you could measure the prediction every step along the way. Yeah. Yes. But I'm kind of surprised they didn't use the other uh, six digits to Why? create other unique sequences. So uh, it's, it's not. It's a. It's a four-category problem at every time step. Just for this one sequence, they also have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 4, 3, 2, 1, so that's a five category problem. Oh, I see. There's, there's two problems here, right? Yeah, I yeah. want to point out. There's two problems. One is classifying the digit correctly, which yeah. is right. one of four, and the other is predicting the next element, uh, which is a complex high order sequence problem. Yeah, um, and, and when you're predicting it, it's one of four possible numbers. Yeah. It's not one of ten. Yeah, yeah. So that's that. That, that, that will inflate the accuracy yeah, numbers. Yeah. If I was to mention that, that's, I guess, that's yeah, the reason yeah. I think that accuracy has nothing to do yeah, with yeah. the classification. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a sequence classification, and it would be a harder sequence classification problem if you had more than four digits. Right, right. Yeah. So I mean, it still it, has to classify the digit in some, between these four because the digits are coming from the test set, which yeah, are different from yeah, the training set. Yeah. That was your point earlier. Uh, I think that's that's so it's but not it's, a trivial problem. But it's classifying in terms of the sequence, not independently. Right? It is, yeah, it's yeah. not like I just spoke. They don't go back later. Do they go back later and say here's a here's a, a, a bit, an image to tell me what it is? Or has it always been the sequence? Well, because this classifier is trained on the hidden memory state, uh, yeah. they can't just pass in a, a full image. Okay. Um, but what they do do is they take this memory state, they train the classifier once for the current image and once for the next image, and they show that the same exact memory state is able to capture the representation the memory state encodes information for both the current item and the next item. Yeah, so the which would be true for our uh, mm -hmm. for temporal yeah. memory as well. Right. Yeah. I, I missed that. Is that important? Uh, the, it would be equivalent to saying the TM state captures the current input as well as the next. Yeah. yeah. OK. But it's, all, but it's all done in a single um, cell activation yes. matrix, which but is different. It's not just the, uh, oh, it's the current state and the next state? Or yeah, the current state would be the many columns that are currently active. Yeah. And the specific su set of cells that are active would tell you what the, the next. Uh, but they also tell you what the previous history of. Cells yeah, 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 yeah. Tells you everything. It's it's the way we the way I was speaking about is you have this melody and the, the current state is both the current note and exactly your location on that melody. Yeah, right? it yeah. could be. It's just that point in the melody. Yeah. Uh, so are you saying that the current cells? Indicate what the next element of the sequence is. is. Like, it, so if the next element is a is whatever a five, a certain set of cells are active. If yeah. the next element is a six, the TM set, state tells you exactly what the next prediction is. Unless that's like the unless prediction point of, um, unless like if there's that be good, it'll tell you the next. Okay, so so it, yeah. okay, so it's not going to be specific to the next element if there are multiple possible. Well, in this case, they they trained train it. On just this one sequence, there is no there is no other options. Sure, in this case. Yeah. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. If there's multiple possible predictions that are valid, given input, we're going to predict both yeah. of them. Yeah. yeah. But that won't happen here, right? Uh, that won't happen in this case. Yeah. Uh, and it won't happen in general that there are other them. I mean, that's an interesting question because we had to handle that case with the unions, right? 
And so it's not clear that this would work with unions. Uh, I'm not sure who does or doesn't, I don't know yet. But if you're going to handle that ambiguity, then you have to have some way of representing multiple possibilities. Yeah. They don't have that, uh -huh. from what I understand. Uh -huh. Yeah, I believe that's right. Um, I think that, well, okay, actually, let me get to that at the end. So they, they demonstrate a couple of other uh, tasks. They have this uh, reinforcement learning paradigm where they attach a, a deep Q learning network that is able to do a very simple kind of pathfinding task. Um, which is not super interesting. They just essentially show that adding RSM memory to the DQA and allows it to solve the problem, whereas without it, it can't solve the problem. Um, and then the more interesting task, which is a more useful benchmark, I think, for what we're working on is um, this Penn Tree Bank data set in which you have uh, a million words in order, uh, 10,000 vocabulary size, and you have to do next word prediction. So you get a sentence in every word you're trying to predict the next word that's going to come in. Um, so this, they, they have results for this that don't compare that well to kind of state-of-the-art um, LSTM but demonstrate does pretty well in comparison to older recurrent neural networks. Um, I always thought this is something that we would be good at. Uh, you know, I'm always amazed how poor the prediction I get on my phone for the next word, you know? And, um, and it seems like if I really wanted to, we could attack that problem and do a much better job at it. Um, and so this is an interesting problem. So. Is there a benchmark that's for this that has this? Tons thing? of benchmarks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the one they used is called Pen Tree Bank. It's just a big data. It's a corpus of data. Yeah. They have a test set and training set, and they can they just they report the numbers on how good are you at predicting the next word in the sequence. So it, there's this huge set of language, and then you then you break it up into the test set and the training set. And then yeah, and you feed it in one word at a time, one sequence at a time, and you're learning as you go. So you're updating the memory, just like the MNIST sequences yeah. words are. I just this, just this is an aside. It seems that the right solution to this problem in terms of like your phone is to both be based on sort of your corpus of learning, but also recent learning, right? So you'd want to have um, you'd want to have a continuously learning model with the decay to it. And also to should be for somebody like do you know that Swift key like an app? The what? A Swift key. Swift key. Is that, yeah. that the one where you uh, I don't know what that was that one? No, but it also like, like, like predicts what you want to type. So you yeah. give it, you give access to all your messages, all your email, yeah. and it learns also from. So yeah. it improves based on your yeah. customized options. Yeah, so that's what I guess is basically what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, um, like specific. I don't know, whatever the built-in yeah. one in the Android is not that great. Yeah. Yeah, but I think we have to be a little careful. The built-in stuff on Android and iPhone is not representative of state of the art yeah. Yeah. at all. I don't state like of the art is really good. I don't know yeah, how to fix it. Yeah. Probably, I don't know. That's a stuff. Right? <laughs> the, the thing is, it yeah. has to be very small. You know, mem the memory and speed yeah. footprint has to be really tiny to be, uh, yeah. be predicted. The problem is, it doesn't run on your phone. So, for yeah. example, Microsoft, if yeah. you run it, if you're connected, it's a lot yeah. better than if you're offline. Because if you're offline, it just has your phone. I bet you can do that. I bet you our stuff can run pretty well offline. Yeah. Yeah. Because the phone is not like a great card. Yeah, I mean, but you know, we're not, we, did, we did this with uh, our type of sequence memory. We wouldn't have this big monster. Anyway. Yeah, it, uh, deep learning is fantastic at this task. Okay. But really, really the issue is that then you have to be online. Yeah. Uh, there's this new GP2 stuff, which is yeah. really amazing. All right, we'll go. We'll maybe yeah. but, but very computational. Very computational. It, it, it's all about it's power efficiency. It's all about the computational efficiency, really. Yeah. No, it, uh, as a problem, it's kind of a solved problem. Yeah, okay. surprising. Well, I, it, did, it never appealed to me as, as something to go after because I felt like it's, it's a marginal problem in terms of its, um, its value and, um, and, and potential solutions. It just was, you know. Yeah. And just so, give me one, one question. When you say it's, it's better than a traditional RMN, uh, do you include the gated memory units as well, like LSTMs and GRUs? So, they, they compared to. Um, they don't compare it to LSTM. The LSTMs are getting like down to 50 per flux of years, something like that, in the state of the art. Um, and they're saying that this this network is sort of comparable to RNNs from like five years ago. They they report 166. But that is thing is like 91, it's very old. Sorry. And this thing is I think it's from 91 or something. It's like very old, like very old. Yeah. Um, I think they were trying to get away from the complexity of the model and the okay. memory requirements of LSTMs. Well, well, but my main question is that uh, the innovation that these gated memory units brought yeah. is that they can keep memory from a very, very old yes. uh, sequence. Yeah. That's the first time. 
fix their, their constraints. So do they do they compare with this gated memory image and show that this is better? Or just like traditional RNNs that don't have gated memory image? So it's not better than uh, networks with gated memory units. Oh, it's not. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I was wondering, I'm, I'm not, it's not clear to me how that memory thing works. So how does it integrate memory over like a very long period of time? Yeah, so um, it's just, so the memory is just the previous state of the network. It's just so the network is changing all the time and you're just decaying it exponentially. And so the network is constantly updating with new input and new predictions. Oh, okay. So it's the, the previous entire state memory is here. The previous state of the hidden unit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just like our temporal memory, the previous state is, mm -hmm. keeps information from way back when. Um, th this does, but the theory the, could do the same but thing. But even in our temporal memory, I think that the number of time steps you can remember is limited to the number of cells you have in the column, right? Yeah. No. You, you have like a limited uh, number of really really It could be 100,000 steps. Uh, oh. I mean, it depends. It's limited by the number of dendrites, the yeah. number of segments you have. But I mean, like, it, cells, but it's not tied to the number of cells. But you don't have like a mechanism if you want to remember like a million steps before you move. That there is no way it could. Like, it, it's eventually just going like, to yeah. overfit to the most more. Uh, no. No? no? Well, <laughs> yeah, do you need to redo the TNS? No, I, 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 I don't think we're going to work. It's just that but, but not, not, not in terms of like not in terms of like network dynamics. There's no way for just an activity to to just like remember a novel sequence or remember what happened a long time ago. It has to have like this chain of dendrites that that's connecting yeah. it all. Like it, there need to be learning connections between every step. And so maybe that's what you're getting. At yeah, that that's, that's, there is a fit representation capacity, even if it's like very, very large, it's, I see it's still Yeah, gated. there's a fixed capacity. It's because the gated memory, it can, uh, you're, you can remember even from like a billion times. That's right, yeah. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. the difference. Yeah. Right. yeah, I think that's right. And the rebar error sort of gets at that. Yeah, I didn't discuss that, but they, they didn't even replicate it, they just mentioned the, the Dimension paper from 2016 that looked at that. Um, so, so the language modeling, do, do you say, like, are they just for each word activating a certain set of many columns, uh, mapping each word into? Uh, yeah, so it, gets, it goes through an embedding, um, and then it goes through the exact same network structure. The only difference is there is an embedding now. So it's like a 300 dimensional embedding. So these words, are they, are they doing any kind of thing where they're using, like, word to back? Converted, converted into so I actually don't know. They didn't mention that, so I'm pretty sure no. I'm pretty sure like they're training and embedding. Just like random SDRs, essentially, for each word? Or I think that uh, they're used, I don't know because they don't mention it, but my guess is that they're, they're training up an embedding from scratch. And so they're building a, a language model or embedding model based on the corpus. Okay. So this is a 300 dimensional embedding matrix, and it's trained based on, I guess, the traditional, like the word vec style of training from context. Okay. Um, so you're going to get these distributed vectors for each word. And then you're going to pass that into the network and produce predictions from that. But that, that's a question that I had for them that I want to follow up with because I don't understand exactly. It could be they're using some pre trained embedding as well and they didn't mention it. Um, because I have not perfectly replicated the results from the language modeling yet. The MNIST looks really good, the language modeling doesn't. Um, okay, so just uh, quickly, we already discussed most of this in terms of comparisons with uh, HTM or the things that are physically different, so obviously this is continuous, and we have... Um, Did you know in terms of its uh, weights, and, points, weights uh, and uh, activations? Correct, right. yep. Um, and we're, we're sparse, whereas this is dense weights initially, even though there's a masking step on activations. They're using backprop, they're limited across two layers only, whereas I guess HTM, um, do we consider it a heavy learning algorithm, or what do we call it? Yeah, it's heavy in style, yeah. Heavy in style, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Everything is contained in a single activity vector, which allows them to get to kind of tout this much lower memory requirement. Um, so all the predictions and activations, uh, uh, sorry, and so in HTM we, we store predictions and activations separately in column level activity and cell level activity. Um, they have this refractory inhibition, which is parallel to what we do with boosting. Um, their architecture is explicitly generative. I think it's, we've done some classification of generative stuff with HTM as well, I believe, but that's not explicitly built into the network, so they are constantly producing a predicted image for the next time step. Um, even though that's not the, the memory representation, uh, the network is trained on this loss function that's trying to produce images. Um, and the size... Well, it's interesting because they're, they're trying to predict a novel image every time. Yeah. Uh, yes. Which is interesting. That's, uh, I think that's probably the biggest difference, yeah. uh, the biggest advantage of this technique over yeah. temporal memory. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the other really big difference that I see is this single activity vector. So I believe my understanding, so we're doing um, winner take all at a different time, I think. So I believe that this architecture allows um, the which columns are activated to be active, to be influenced by the recurrent input in a way that HTM doesn't. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we are summing two activations and then we're picking winners from that. So we have really strong recurrent input. We can actually activate columns that have no connections to the input at mm. time zero. Okay. That's, I think that's really different because I think that essentially allows us to generate column level representations based only on predictions. And actually, essentially, it, it uh, unties from the current real time sensory input, which is something that I think is interesting because I think uh, potentially that's useful in the way you know, uh, human neural networks work, but it's very well, different. You know, this, the idea of, sort of the uh, uh, predictive, um, what we call active prediction, like, right? The temporal memory has what is it? Prediction, which is a non-active state of the neuron. It's, yeah. it's internal, you can't read it out, right? Yeah. You have a bunch of neural tissue, you look at the neurons, it's not reflected in their spiking activity. Um, but we can make predictions mentally uh, and be conscious of them and act upon them. So there always had to be a sort of separate mechanism for doing active predictions. Um, here you're saying that they're, they've combined them, so this system can make an active prediction right here. Um, I think that's what you just said, like the predictions could just say this is what columns should be active. And then um, actually activates those columns. It activates those columns, which one could argue it has some advantages, but I also think the problem, you lose a lot for that too. I mean, I think there's a real advantage in separating out these two uh, problems. Because um, sometimes you, you don't want that, and sometimes you do. So it's interesting, just a, a different, that's something we've never really, ex we didn't address in the temporal memory algorithm, but we sort of, we think about it a lot in terms of the column architecture where those active predictions are occurring. And here they're saying, hey, we're doing our own one network. Um, but you lose some things with that too, so I'm just talking about The, the place I think it's most useful is to do things like um, filling in occluded input. You know, it's, it's a noisy sensory space. We have really strong predictions. We just go with those predictions. Yeah. That's, I, that's the information. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, Assume we saw it, even if we didn't yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah, but that's but if there's contrary data, um, it's one thing if there's no input and you're trying to guess. But if you actually have data that's coming in, then generally the brain takes that data as correct. Um, but there's contrary versus noise. It's very hard to disassemble. Well, it's just lacking. Right. right. If right. I have no data, I can predict what's going to happen and sort of imagine it. But um, so in the HDM network, if you have an occlusion, you have no data. We can't activate these columns. Yeah. Despite whatever predictions are happening, even a really well, that in the ancient the way we saw that really is more in the in the voting column or voting issue. So um, it's just we don't try to solve that at the sequence level. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they're trying to collapse like multiple. Well, we've yeah. separated out the multiple problems. They're trying to collapse it all into one here, which is yeah. all right. I don't think that's the way biology does, but that's okay from a machine learning point of view. But it does have its downsides. Uh, there, you do have this conflict, like, well, do I believe what I'm really sensing, or do I believe my predictions? And, uh, I'd be curious to see if that actually happens a lot here. In reality, when they do yeah. the train it, you know, the, the What's structurally it's possible, but how often does it actually happen? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, we can look at correlations between the memories connections and the yeah. possible connections yeah. and see what's driving. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. At and the end of the day, they're still going to do the K winner take all in the mini columns. Yes. What happens to the, if there happens to be a cell that was active, activated predictively from the past, like would that this, just it be doesn't get selected by one of these two columns? Like this is not a winning column? Yeah, would that get zeroed out by the exact. Okay, so yeah. you, you couldn't get, you could get a prediction from the recurrent active prediction, but you couldn't get this runaway thing because it would be actively masked for the next time step. Um, mm. It couldn't run away. Uh, I'm not sure because this prediction could be the uh, a really really strong predi uh, prediction, yeah. and then this column actually activates even without any input. Oh, it would be it would win in the case yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. because they're okay. summed okay. together. So that's why I was saying that the predictive influence can actually produce column level activation right, the way right. the HTM can't. And what they're doing is they're actually decoding directly from column level activations to produce the prediction to generate the yeah. image. So the column of activations is what? How many columns do they have in this network? Usually 200 to 600, 200 for MNIST and 600 for, uh, for language modeling. Yeah. That's so smaller than, than, smaller than typical HGM. Well, that's, that's, that's more biologically accurate. How, how, is, how is the, in the language modeling, how do they include encoding, like or how encoding? For the language modeling? Yeah. Um, using an embedding, training an embedding. But it's, it's initially it's just a, a vector of IDs. So like a word So I'm not, I'm not using a pre-trained embedding. 
um, we're just training them back from scratch. So it comes in, yes, for one hunt. Oh, okay. Are they the same method as like the motor side? So I'm using PyTorch's embedding module, which I think is the same. Okay. Yeah. But I don't, they don't specify what they're using, so I don't actually know. Yeah, probably. I suppose there's a possibility they're not doing any embedding at all. It seems unlikely, right? If they were just using one hot, it seems like this would be a way harder problem. Yeah, this would be a way harder problem. They're just using one hot to code, and then you don't have like some money to directly think. But I'm going to ask them about that because. Yeah. But it, does it say in the paper how yeah. they do it? No, not the embedding step. And then it's it's, it's quite crucial, like, like how you represent your, your raw data, it's like half the problem, right? I know. <laughs> Another big thing I don't think you have listed there is that you can't handle ambiguous sequences, right? If you were to start in the middle of a sequence, you can't yeah. maintain that yeah, ambiguity yeah. for a while because you're doing the one cell per column. Yeah, you're right. I was thinking of just like architecture differences, but you're right. There's um, performance differences as well, potentially. That's, yeah, I think you know better than I would whether you can just infer that directly from the one cell active, but it seems Yeah, like you need to have multiple cells, cells active really good. to do that properly. So one of the things we'll try is, is multi uh, allowing multiple cells to be active. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting kind of extension of this. Yeah. Um, so the major problem that they referenced in the paper uh, is that it's very hard for this kind of architecture to generalize to unseen sequences. So they do really well memorizing uh, pen tree bank, which is this huge data set. So they, they can memorize these huge sequences. They can get perplexity of nine, Next word prediction accuracy of 50% on the training set. So that demonstrates the uh, capacity of the memory. But that's overfitting like crazy. And so once you give a test, um, test data, it doesn't have any idea what to do with it. So they train for, to get their best test numbers, they train for a quarter of an epoch, so let's say 25% of the data set. And then they can get uh, 166 perplexity. Mm. But it's still not very good in comparison to more modern well, techniques. What is per perplexity again? Um, it's the exponential of the <laughs> negative logarithmic. Um, it, it seems to be what everyone uses for reporting on uh, language modeling. Now I'm all higher in sports. Used. You said you said that it. Um, so, if you just start in the middle of a sequence, this can't pick it up. Yeah. And if we go back to the MNIST example um, with this, like all this network has to do is play back this sequence. It has to play back zero one two three zero one two three. Uh, it can yes. just ignore its inputs. And it will pass this test if it's. Uh, how do we know that this isn't just a network that, that you just flash it with anything and it starts playing 0, 1, 2, 3? Uh, oh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I don't know. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, uh, unless, uh, unless you can, you, you'd want to show like with other sequences it outputs something different. It'd be, it'd be nice yeah, if, yeah. If, if it starts in the middle of the sequence, it's able to, to figure out where it is in the sequence. Then, it, then, it, then it'd be doing what we think it's doing. Um, I think that's a great question. We, I don't know if we know. I'm, I'm get like really. I would give them probably the benefit of the doubt. This they, they'd probably notice if this were what was going on. But that just so comes all the batches start exactly at zero. So sometimes you're getting thrown into the middle of a sequence. To oh, they do. Step. Well, the batches are random cuts. Okay. Um, so some of them are not going to start here. Got it. Okay. So yeah, but that's if, weird because if they start in the middle, they would never be able to predict the end. Um, Let's say you start at the second zero, one, two, three. There's no way you'd predict the last four. It would be actually incorrect in some sense. We need to predict the first zero. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, first zero. But I think I need to remind myself how we do the batching. Um, maybe it's true that it's all just fully sequential and deterministic. Yeah. But I mean, your answer, I think your answer satisfied my question. The, the, the issue I just, the potential issue I just raised, is solved if they if they start at random points through the sequence. But then two time rates to go. I don't have access to their code, so this is a question that I can ask them as well. Yeah, I think you really need to have multiple sequences with you know, high order confusion in between, be able to do start in the middle. Um, yeah, I wonder if they try them. And I think Marcus's sequences. point is great. With this one, just training on one, you could feed it almost anything, and it could just replay the, one, the single sequence it knows and completely ignore the input from then on. It like, sort of ties to your previous point, like the recurrent input can drive the columnar activity. So it could just completely ignore the proximal input and still get 100% on this task. Yep, yep that's true. Yeah, it's uh, not a very naturalistic training set, is it? <laughs> but maybe that's just a debugging thing. The language modeling is really the, the one they're going after. That's right, yeah. yeah. And that has very different statistics. It doesn't have that problem. Um, 
Yeah, so the thing that they're trying to solve now, or that they mentioned they, they want to figure out how to deal with, is just uh, exposure to novel words and novel sequences, which this does very poorly because of the overfitting problem. Um, and so they were talking to us on this call about um, attentional structures and things like that that might allow uh, looking farther back in time. Um, but uh, it seems like generalization is the thing that they're struggling with. So could you explain structure. again the gen they're overfitting? So they've uh, learned really long sequences from this huge data set. And so yeah. they can predict next word on the training yeah. set. They've already seen that many times before. Yeah. When you give it a test set of words they've never seen or sequences they've never seen before, then it does a very poor job of doing prediction. So it's, it's a creating a model that's yeah. essentially memorized the training set's yeah. sequences. Yeah. And the thing that the language model is realized, the language, the training set is a lot bigger than the test set. That's true in this case. Sometimes too. It, there's a lot of uh, repetition between both. Mm -hmm. So what people have been studying is that you know, if you actually go and look at the sequence in the test set and then in the train set, it's the test set is like contained in the train set. Uh, but since we're just like attaching so many documents when you're learning a language model, you're not actually like seeing the data, but there, there are a lot of studies mm -hmm. like analyzing data sets mm -hmm. and saying, you're just like, well, you can just overfit what yeah, the yeah. test set is already there. Mm -hmm. So there, there are newer mm -hmm. data sets which... Uh, Do you know where like, the true has this? that problem? Right. Do you know whether do you remember the pen tree? Well, the pen tree is quite an old data set, so it might have, yeah. So they have new data sets that try to solve the problem. Because you know, language is all the same, it's just a repetition of things. Yeah. So if I just get like a hundred different uh, textbooks and just concatenate them, a lot of them are gonna say the same thing, people copy and paste on the web, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, there'll be sentences that are repeated. Yeah, they're yeah. the same. Yeah. They're just yeah. copy and paste everywhere. So but also languages copying and pasting to yeah. so make the argument that it's always just memorizing sequences. Yeah. So it's very really interesting to see like some, some problem, some kind of data set that doesn't face this problem. Yeah, yeah. And well, I, in terms of a practical solution, that might be fine, actually. To, you know, but the, the true issue of generalization is very, very difficult because they have, you have to get down to the meanings of the words, yeah. and there's no representational scheme here at all that would get to the meanings of. Well, there's well, the there's embedding. The embedding. So the embedding produces vectors that are more similar. When you say embedding, it's just like, uh, it's a, what do you mean by that exactly? It's a 300 dimensional vector that is just similar to other vectors for words that appear That's in the same context. That's a word the back type of thing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, so they're capturing it that way. There's some semantics in the They're idea. using that. I don't know. I, uh, I'm assuming that. But that, it's a very important stat because if they're using it, I mean, that, like, it's 50% of the problem. But I'm pretty sure they're not using fast text or word -to I'm pretty sure they're just using an embedding that they're training up from scratch on the corpus. Well, but an embedding is the yeah. word -to back. I mean, there are a few ways of doing it. But yeah, yeah. You may it's true. I could be wrong. I'll ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking for an interpreter. It's interesting to kind of list out the strengths and weaknesses of this. You know, I think one strength is kind of like we talked about, it's generalized. It's, it, Unlike the temporal memory, you could create these representations that have similarity somehow. If we give them the benefit of the doubt on the on the MNIST sequences, it's it's generalizing to you know to some extent to new inputs that are just not a because memory. you're always training on novel. Yeah, images. yeah. It's figuring out representations that are somehow can translate to a MNIST digit level yeah. classification. Uh, if we give them the benefit of the doubt there, so that's. One the thing, and um, I think the big negative is the lack of unions. Um, that you just can't do multiple predictions, and and that might explain their their language modeling issue too, because I think you might need that there. Uh, unclear. They must have tried two cells per per column, but they don't report it, so I'm not sure. You don't want to just do two cells all the time. You only want to do two cells when there's when it's ambiguous. Uh, like if, it's, okay. if it's if it's unambiguous, you want you really want one cell per column, so it wouldn't work to hard code two cells per column. In there. I forget how the TM does this. Uh, well, we don't do k winner take all on the minute oh, column. Okay. We okay. just if there's a prediction and you get activity, then you become active. Got it. So there's no comp the competition is all the predicted ones that are equal. Okay. So we just yeah. take away the k winners and then probably pick some things that. Oh, the one one winner. Yeah. Sorry, the, yeah, the yeah. one winner. Yep. Yeah. With that. Um, yeah, I mean, the main thing that they talk about is just the much lower memory requirements. They talk about order of magnitude reductions compared to like LSTMs. This is a very tiny network. Um, I don't have a sense for the memory requirements of LSTM. How does, is there some simple way of describing that? Really simple. I think there's just way more parameters. 
um, because you have that you, you know, forgetting and people know that sounds better than me, but there's like a forgetting. Is, it, but it's, is there more cells, more synapses, more? Uh, I don't. I think both, but more um, synapses because the parameters are like synapses, and so there's more weights to tune by your order of magnitude apparently. Hmm. Sorry, what was your question again? I just the, the idea that this is an order of less order magnitude less memory. Oh, okay. I don't really have a sense for the. I have a good sense for the memory requirements for HM sequence memory. I can just sort of see what's going on here. I didn't have a sense for what LSTM memory requirements are like. Um, so that's I was just trying to figure out where where is that memory being used in LSTM? Are there just more units? Right. Is there more synapses? There's, but you're saying there's a lot more parameters per unit. Yes, yeah, so that's synapses, I think, and then yeah. there's so more cells. You have you have even parameters for the for gate, yeah. yeah. for the remember gate. Yeah. But then it's not in larger of magnitude or higher. It's just like you have three times the number of weights. Maybe yeah, so it's, it's like it's like the number of parameters of a fully connected RNN maybe like times three. Times that's three, because right. then you have forget gate and remember gate. Yeah, you have like times three or four. Yeah, I don't know the exact. But it's not like a large of magnitude. Yeah, I'm not sure where they got that. I mean, it could be that the RNNs that they're comparing to are just much larger networks. No, that yeah. could be it too. They might say, yeah. I mean, you get smaller networks to do this. Yeah. Because this is small. I mean, this was 200 by 6. That's not a whole lot of uh, data. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty small. But it's really cool to see, I mean, in the space of all the deep learning stuff out there, this is way closer to the top of memory, obviously. Yeah. And it, it tries to utilize a lot of the insights uh, from yeah. that, which is pretty cool. Well, that seems like a really interesting jumping off point for yeah. our work. Well, I think also the, it, the thing that keeps jumping out of me as you got in the, low, the lower left-hand corner there is that the, that was my representation of the, uh, that you're training on novel patterns all the time. Yeah. Now, obviously, these are patterns that are from a pre-sorted corpus of patterns, so you're feeding another one or another two, but Still, the idea that uh, that it's always somewhat novel coming in, and we always had some issues with the temporal memory in that regard, which is, you know, the noise could trip up the temporal memory, so we had to rely on some fuller layer uh, or some other artifice to to bridge across the noise. Right? We we would get if we had some slight error in the input, we'd get lost. Um, in theory, that might happen. It might happen to you too, but uh, it's just, if but, it's temporal noise. But it's interesting that they're actually just. Somehow that just keeps jumping out of me, like, oh, they're training on novel things too. And then, yeah. Is that fundamentally important to this network? Um, does that really help? It's not clear to me it actually helps in, in any profound way. Um, but it's an interesting idea, so I'm, I have, I'm still trying to absorb what it means. Um, it just strikes me as jumping something that jumps out and goes, ooh, I thought I mean, about that. You know? If they can in incorporate, if they can create temporal memory representations that encode similarity somehow, I think that would be yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure this does it fully, but that would be a that would be yeah. nice. I like I like how this uses um, learn sequences to then essentially put labels on what's being sensed. Uh, that the, the, it can learn the MNIST digits by first learning a sequence and then seeing see, seeing various versions of that sequence. And now now that it has learned the sequence, it can now label all of these zeros and ones and such. Yeah. Um, it's almost with us. That's like our temporal, our temporal memory training our spatial cooler, you know, mm -hmm. or or like, uh, you no, know, yeah, yeah. That's that's like an extra yeah. signal. Yeah. yeah. Although it's it could be one could also if I want to be a little bit more cynical about it, I could say, well, maybe these different patterns you're training it on are close enough. It's just sort of like noise, you know. So it's it's our temporal our our spatial cooler can handle a certain amount of noise. Yeah. Uh, so again, I'm not sure how to read these accuracy numbers, but. If you just do a spatial cooler and just use that to classify endness, you get about 95% accuracy. Really? 95 and a half, yeah. Well, obviously the sequence helps. Um, well, the, 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 yeah, the sequence helps and the back, back prop should help as well here. Because you're using information, the predictive information to go back and adjust the proximal, the, the spatial cooler rates. The loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I, I guess I was trying to, maybe I misunderstood your comment, Marcus, but I was just trying to say even the temporal memory will, in some sense, you can read out its predictions and uh, it could predict the next element and that prediction should, in theory, uh, improve the classification of the next element. Um, you, you could read that out of the network. So like yeah, the 
spatial cooler will um, it's impervious to noise, uh, but but in its initial training when it's figuring out what is noise and what isn't, uh, th this this is an extra helpful signal. Yeah, this is no, it, it's a very helpful yeah. signal. Yeah, I think it is helpful. Yeah, because you could have two forms of uh, the number seven that are totally different, yeah. and th there would be pressure here to, mm -hmm. to make them more similar. Yeah, and, and this is applicable not just to not just to like higher order sequences, but that, also to sensory motors. Yeah, that would be a, that's a good example of yeah. I just said. Like I have two different ways of arriving to one, right? And um, and our special cooler in all situations might classify them differently. So I would learn those as separate sequences depending which way you drew the one. Here yeah. you might it might force those two categories together. Yeah. Yeah. And say you're going to get a one in both cases. That's the sequence of training of special cooler. Mm -hmm. And and this is equally applicable to the sensory motor stuff. Uh, if uh, um, it, it, this is higher order sequences, but if you're using locations as your predictive signal, it's right. also going to apply there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just just and spell that a little bit further. Uh, make that analogy complete. Maybe like an easy one would be um, would be. I don't know. Here I'll just go trivial. Different coffee cups that are some, that are a little bit di slightly different from each other, um, or or like, um, um, or or under different lighting, or the, okay. the same coffee cup under different lighting. You're getting these different sensory inputs for the same object from the same location, same viewing location, uh, and your mini columns are now learning to kind of group all those together uh, because you have this training signal of. Um, the sensors at this location and orientation. So it's mm. similarly. Um, Would it do that? What? Uh, Would it do that? Uh, I'm trying to think. Because let's say it was that you were looking at we, we, we don't have no, some. No, code currently we don't do that. I'm wondering if this would actually do that. I don't think you, I don't think uh, this would solve the coffee cup lighting problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, but why, but why I, not? This, uh, this axis. Because I don't want doesn't. to. I don't want to group all those different inputs as the same. Uh, because they're only. It only makes sense in the in the concept of the entire object. It, it's like the. Um, uh, I think this would do that. I don't well, know if no, we here's why I think it might not, and I'm not confident of this. But say you're looking at a coffee cup under good lighting, yeah. and you're viewing it. You know, so you get a sequence under good lighting, and it's trying to predict the next thing. Now you see the coffee cup under bad lighting. Now you're getting a sequence that's completely under bad lighting. But there's nothing to tie the first sequence to the second sequence. What, in, wait, in what, what, um, you see what I mean? Yeah, recognizing that this is the what well, have some way of re recognizing this is my coffee cup. You touch it, you you do something. You you. But you, you don't have to know it's a coffee I'm cup. Yeah, very, yeah, I'm yeah. saying something very straightforward right now. Okay, the lighting in the room changes. You you're already observing a coffee cup. Someone oh, dims okay. the lighting, uh, and so you already know that. Yes. You can come up with all so these in that case, in that case, it might work. But if you're Looking at a coffee cup under one lighting, then you go away and do other stuff. Now you're looking at a coffee sure. cup under yeah. different lighting. Yeah. There's this, nothing. This here. generalization has to be learned. Well, through. I think I don't. Yeah, think it has to be changing while. I don't think there. if if the solution is that the the spatial cooler input says all oh, these two inputs are the same, that's not going right. to work. I, I have that picture, that Adelson picture of the uh, the checkerboard with the cylinder on it and the shadow. I have that in the book, and where you have those two squares in the checkerboard, label A and B, and one looks white and one looks dark, but they're actually the same, right? So um, you don't want the system to learn that that color is the same as that color, because mm -hmm. that would be wrong. Um, you, it turns out under this particular lighting situation, they're the same, but, but under other lighting conditions, they're not the same, so that's a situation where you wouldn't want the input to just say, oh, I see those two patterns as being the same, because then, you, then the, the, the checkerboard would disappear. Um, so it, it's, it's, there's a, it's a bigger problem than that. Anyway, I, I still think the idea that, that training the spatial pool from the sequence is interesting. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm with you 100% on this, how it applies. And, and I open that up by saying, here's a trivial, dumb example. Yeah, yeah. It's not my favorite one. Yeah, I'll I'll think that, I don't think that, that, no, I'm not sure that one works. But it's an interesting idea, so. Um, yeah. To me, that's a very key thing that we're missing right now. We're sort of creating these sort of generalizable representations of the sequences, and we don't have that anywhere, really. In, our in the sequences themselves. It's um, in the sequences or in our columns paper, the so, object so, models are so totally different. We want to just jump to a totally different paradigm. The one that always bothered me, if you think of sequences as like a melody, we don't have pigeon bearings. 
Uh, yeah. So you can play the melody in different keys. And um, so we never had that. Always bothered me. I, I put that as a requirement early on, but but I felt like the solution became clear through displacements. Because <laughs> really, what you want to learn is the sequence of displacements, and and that's the answer to that problem. So we now are learning sequences of sensory input, but the melody itself is probably learned as a sequence of displacements. We haven't really developed that idea completely yet. But to me, that's the general solution. It's not in the sequence memory itself. It's the sequence memory has to be applied to displacements. Um, so we, we don't do that now. We think of the sequence memory applied to your input. Uh, yeah, I think of something. Uh, so I think that might be solved by displacement, but there are other situations which wouldn't be solved by displacements. Like, um, suppose like someone gives me, uh, you know, weird coffee cup that you get, uh, you know, in, in these tourist shops, you have all these weird yeah. looking coffee cups. I've never seen yeah. this before, and I immediately know it's a coffee cup. Yeah. Right. Uh, how would we, you know, yeah. there's a lot of differences between, yeah. how, you know, the Numenta coffee cup and that one. Yeah. How do we? One could argue that that's, um, you could think of that as a sequence with, think of that as a temporal sequence sensory motor sequence was sloppy, um, sloppy um, specific timing. <laughs> and so the order of the items and as you move around spatially is right, but the actual distances is, are off, weird. Yeah. So it's like it's like I've taken that coffee cup and I've stretched it in different various ways, but I haven't reversed the order of things. I can take a face, I can stretch the position of things, but I haven't repositioned things. Um, and so it's it's sort of like a, it's like a melody where the the, the, the the distance between each notes has been stretched, and, but it, the uniqueness of the melody is preserved in the particular order of notes. So something like that. I'm not making up answers as we talk. I don't have answers to answer the question, but I, I, and that is a, a, a real problem for us that we have to address one day, and we haven't done it yet. I agree with you. But I think the both ways of doing it, uh, and I still think they go back to. Um, uh, displacements and stretchiness of the uh, of the space and time. <laughs> in a really bad way to answer. <laughs> anyway. Um, I don't think I had anything specifically to add to this, except for a couple of things we talked about trying uh, in terms of building on this model, but it seems like the first thing is just getting a, a decent baseline with the... I, I, I was going to ask you, what, what do you see as like future directions after we do, do we want to replicate this model? Is that our goal? So That's what he's I've been just it. quickly trying out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, has I, a I've replicated it, it does working. well when I'm missed, and it, it does not as well on the language modeling yet. So if we had a really nice baseline, then we could try some of these changes we want to make, some of the things that we think might be uh, limiting this or our diversion from some of the things that we think are going on, and then see if they improve. Mm. Um, but it's just one possible direction. Yeah, I would you know, maybe initially go back to the end of sequences and just try to see how it can handle the problems. issues we already yeah. talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, ambiguous sequences and all 10 categories instead of just four. Um, yeah, how to do on 10. And, and you know, having ambiguous high order sequences. So, yeah. They mentioned using 10, but not in, a, not in a high order sequence context. So they can learn zero to nine. That's obvious. Yeah, so I'll play with that. But they, you know, since it's a janitor model, I would, and so we talked about the idea like, oh, I have two ways of writing a seven or two ways of writing a five or something like that. So you could literally just come up with complete, you, you could say sixes and nines are the same and, and train on the system when, with five digits or six digits. Right? Now the question then comes up is, that it was curious to me, say, so, okay, so this system should figure out that sixes and nines represent the same thing. Um, let's say we let's say they represent six. Then what does the general model generate when it tries to predict? It's going to be like a blurry eight. So does it do it? Is that what it would do? Well, what no, it, it might just do the one most likely one. one also. Um, the, the generative stuff looks exactly like a blurry version of multiple digits. So I mean, when it's learning still, and it's, and it's ambiguous, it's not sure whether it's going to be a... But after it's one. learned... Um, oh, I see, because uh, half the time we'd be trained on an eight, and half the time we'd be trained... I'm sorry, six a nine, and half the time we'd be trained on a six. So, but if it yeah, generates an eight, then now we always give it a, a, an error, a training error, because they're using that difference. A partial error, not a full error, because it well, got harder. If it says, hey, this looks like an eight, 
Well, that doesn't look well, right. What I meant was like the bottom of a, you know, a six and a nine. I, mean, I know, I understand like what you're nine. saying, but so it's, it's so what it predicts, if, if it's always predicting something which never looks like the thing it just got. So it's going to get a six, or it's going to get a nine, but it predicts something that looks like an eight. What would it do? <laughs> It'll do something that on average gives it the lowest error. Yeah, but I agree with Jeff, it's very weird of thinking of an autoencoder, where the, the next, what's trying to encode is like changing, how the sequence could change. I mean, yeah. In my head, it, it would have worked, but I, That's the brain I, I love this to you. Yeah. The brain is never right in its predictions. It's all about making use of the prediction error that it's getting. I don't know. Well, maybe, I don't know. Do you write it at a pixel level of detail? Well, well then we don't, I don't think we do pixel level, uh, uh, sort of. We, we, I don't think what the brain, the lowest level I don't think the brain does this. <laughs> I don't think the brain generates pixel level image and, and uses it as a training. So even if it's not pixel level, even if it's like one higher level abstraction, you think we can, we've generated any exact replicas of the next sensory input? Uh, at the, if it's an abstraction, sure, often we do, not always. If I'm trying to predict the next word in the sequence, often I can predict it exactly. Um, and I can't predict the actual the specific sounds and all that stuff, but I can predict the next the representation of that particular element. Um, sometimes I can do that, you know, often. It, it, at an abstract level, I think we can. That's like the sequence of displacements, you know. I guess the melody predicts the next actual note in the melody. I can predict that really accurately, but not necessarily the next actual sounds that come to my ear. The other problem is that there's sort of like a binocular rivalry thing going on where we have representations that are predicting both, but they cross inhibit each other because we do have a sub representation of a six and a nine. Like there's two kinds of sixes. There's the nine kind of six and the six yeah. kind of six. And then we can make predictions for both. Um, but maybe some sort of like something stochastic in the network produces a very nice six or a very nice nine each time because we've never seen the eight before. Mm -hmm. So really we learn a sub hierarchy, I think is the answer. Whether this network can learn that or, or not, I don't know. But yeah, there's no hierarchy really here, right? Uh, they can't, yeah. and they mentioned this on the call, they can't the really stack it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and stacking it doesn't necessarily work. It was designed to be stacked, where you take the uh, memory outputs and you feed them into the next layer. But what they saw in experiments was that the higher layers just learn the same sequences as the lower layers. And so yeah. it's not beneficial. That's something that I think we could potentially play with as well. I think there's potentially ways to tune parameters for higher networks to maybe encourage invariant structures, maybe um, less inhibition at higher levels. Yeah, so you, that they you can, can have kind of longer pooling between layers as well. Like you can force an invariant representation between through the smaller um, memory sizes. Or? Yeah, like you can do some kind of some sort of spatial pooling between yeah. one layer and the other. So like you force an invariant representation in the next layer, so it doesn't learn the same sequence, but a sequence of a yeah. more invariant. Uh, or the way it just here is that it's only learning on top a single transition from a zero to a one at this level. So there's another level on top. Maybe you've got the zero to one, maybe you're predicting that goes to a two to a three. That's still just, with two layers of hierarchies, you only get like a s three transitions. We can't get like really high order sequence and then stay active for a while and transition to another really high order sequence. It seems like a hard problem. Does our work on sparsity here relate to this at all? Would these networks improve by any, I mean there's this max pooling thing which selects certain mini columns, but other than that, everything is fully connected. And yeah, we could try sparsifying the weights. I don't. I just don't know. Would that? What? What sort of intuition would that stuff improve this as well? I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> it just <laughs> strikes me as. Um, well, I think to solve the union, they need to have sparse. <laughs> well, they're, but they're not trying to solve. They're not the trying to solve the union, union but uh, I think that's I just, one thing that, that would help. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking what in terms of whether it's in terms of accuracy or in terms of memory requirements or in terms of speed, I don't know. I just, would, would our sparsity stuff work here too? Um, I don't know. I'll just say yes without a uh, proof. I have a dumb question actually. What happens when you stack spatial pooling? Can you get like more and more invariant representations? Just the regular HTM spatial pooler? Yeah. Not really. Can you stack yeah, on top of If you have temporal pooling, you can get more invariant. Oh, I mean, like you have a space pooling, pooling one. and then you go from an SDR to another SDR. Can you just get this new SDR and go into a new spatial folder and then like stack them? I mean, you I can stack them, but you're not going to get increased in the number. Oh, no. okay. Yeah, but it's, that's the point. You have to have some sort of temple aggregation step to say these things, these different things belong together. Otherwise, if you don't add some sort of temporal aggregation step, there's no new information in the second. 
Uh, there's yeah. nothing new added by going from one spatial pool to another spatial pool. There's it's no new information. The same thing, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like you're taking a zip file and you're re-zipping it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, you can do it, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a general theme that time is necessary to build new knowledge. Right. The time adjacency is the key element in all these situations to build new knowledge out of a spatial pattern. Mm. Yeah, and this is self-supervised learning, right? It's using yeah, time yeah. in order to generate labels. Yeah. Yes. yes, I thought that was really cool, that what they did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. that part's pretty interesting. And that uh, reminds me of some of the stuff we saw at ICML, the, the predictive contrast yeah. to predictive coding stuff from time as well. Yeah. Um, OK. Thanks. This is great. That was fun. Yeah. That was interesting to see and um, new stuff.